lecture will cover the introduction to the whole immune system. The immune system is a very important part of microbiology. In fact, most courses, it's at least a third to a quarter, of quarter to a third, or even half the class, is really to learn about how the body reacts to the invasion of these pathogens. So the immune system, to introduce you to the topic, the immune system is basically all the parameters and all the weapons and all the physiological processes the body possesses in terms of identifying the pathogen as well as eradicating the pathogen. So really, pathogens are really can be considered as anything foreign to the body. So the body is also protecting us from different uh, pollutants, uh, things in the water, you know, metals, chemicals. It's not just living microbiology organisms, it's also other things as well. So immunity, to define what immunity is, is really all of the physiological mechanisms that allow the body to recognize these uh, foreign materials and then eradicate them. So there are two uh, arms of the immune system. There's the nonspecific arm and the speci specific arm. And these two don't really work separately. They're working together all the time. But in terms of learning about these aspects of immunity, it's best to learn each one individually. And then later in the lectures, we'll bring them both together. So the nonspecific aspect of immunity includes barriers and it includes also different mechanisms that are inherently there in the body that don't require identification of the pathogen. They uh, are there basically as a nonspecific barrier. And also that the nonspecific aspect of the immune system involves inflammation as well. Now the specific arm of the immune system requires identification of the specific identity of the pathogen and also a very specific response is launched against that specific pathogen. So the specificity part of that aspect of immunity is essential. And that uh, arm of the immune system is called the classic immune response. So the immune system also includes the physiological barriers that are just inherent in the living body. And so in describing these aspects of immunity, we'll begin by illustrating the barriers, and then we'll discuss the nonspecific arm of the immune system and then the specific arm. And as I mentioned, we'll bring it all together and look at case examples. So the innate immune response consists of physical barriers, consists of various cells of innate immunity, consists of complement and also the antigen itself. These innate responses, again, are inherent to the organism and they don't require identity of the pathogen. The adaptive immune response, on the other hand, does require identification of the pathogen and it uh, also elicits that specificity, elicits a very unique and particular reaction. Uh, cells involved in the adaptive immune system include the T cells and the uh, B cells. And the B cells are responsible for producing the antibodies. And here in this, you'll see this figure throughout many of the lectures. And basically this figure includes all of the immune cells and all of the immune mechanisms. So you'll see here that the T cells Okay, and the B cells here, and here are the T cells. The, these uh, two cells are the main components of the adaptive immune system. And, and then here's another T cell here. So these T cells, and then all over here is basically the innate immune system. So here it is again. You can see that the adaptive immune uh, arm of the system is far more complex than innate immunity, although other investigators would not agree with me on that one. 
uh, to be quite honest, they're both very complex. And uh, they both uh, work together, as I mentioned before, even though we will discuss them separately. So here you can see adaptive immunity includes uh, natural and artificial innate immunity, at least on this uh, in this diagram is actually on its own, but it, as I mentioned before, has its own level of complexity. So what is immunology? Immunology is the study of the reaction between the host and the foreign substance. Immunity is discrimination between the self and non-self. So in order for the immune system to function in a healthy way, it needs to be able to identify what you know, the molecule or the protein, whether or not it belongs to the human host or it's foreign. And if it's foreign, then it'll launch an attack. Now, the other aspect of immunity we're going to discuss is when immunity doesn't work properly, when it's uh, dysfunctional. And we have things like allergies and autoimmune processes and autoimmune diseases. So we will cover those as well. Uh, so the immune system, again, consists of all the cells, the tissues, and organs that coordinate protection of the host against these foreign materials. And, of course, it consists of innate immunity and acquired, or some other uh, investigators call it adaptive immunity. So to begin the dis introduction, introductory discussion, we're going to talk about the barriers to infection, and these are both mechanical and chemical. So the mechanical barriers are basically the skin, of course, and the epithelial cells, and the epithelial cells, as we know, includes the cells that cover the skin, that cover the respiratory tract, that cover the digestive tract, and that also cover the uh, re reproductive tract, and these all these epithelial cells, one of the primary functions of the epithelial cell in general is to provide protection. Uh, we also have a number of membranes that line organs, that separate systems. These membranes are also barriers to infection. And we have the mechanism where when the epithelial cells slough off, which they do quite often, uh, and, and when they're replaced, that this process of sloughing off can actually rid the body of whatever bacteria or pathogens are there in the epithelial cells themselves. We also have goblet cells, and these goblet cells produce mucus. So we have mucus secretions in both the respiratory, in the digestive, and then finally also in the reproductive tract, and these mucus uh, also facilitate uh, the keeping the moisture in these systems, but also they coat the epithelial surface and they protect the epithelial cells from pathogens. So these epithelial surfaces in particular, the skin, there are immune cells that just live underneath the skin, of course, but then just the barrier that the skin provides itself is very important and it's very effective to quite a few pathogens. It's the primary uh, defense. It's the first line of defense in the body. It's in, most pathogens cannot get into the body through the skin and we'll learn uh, as we go through all the pathogens what the different mechanisms they have that are employed. We have, you know, arthropods, we have flying insects who do things like bite the skin or, you know, certainly in mosquitoes, they insert their proboscis into the skin and they have solved the problem of invading the skin, but a lot of other pathogens cannot get in. And we know, for instance, with uh, open wounds and cuts and, you know, stepping on a rusty nail, for instance, that that certainly is a way that pathogens uh, could get in uh, under the skin. So with, as we discussed, with the cellular turnover, with these epithelial cells sloughing off, that that removes pathogens that happen to be on the surface of the epithelial cells themselves. So to continue with our 
mechanical discussion. We also have, of course, mucosal surfaces, including the eyes, gastrointestinal tract, the genitals, uh, the genital uh, urinary tract, and the respiratory tract. Uh, we have tears that uh, flush out pathogens, so crying sometimes is good for you. Uh, and we also have mucosal secretions, of course, and these secretions, as we know, cover the uh, respiratory tract, but they also coat the genital tract, and they trap uh, pathogens for excretion. We also have what's called the mucociliary escalator, and that is where the cilia move uh, particles and pathogens basically out of the body through an escalator kind of function. And these motile cilia move rhythmically and upward. Uh, they expel inhaled or swallowed pathogens and foreign objects from the bronchioles, which are the very small uh, air sacs in the lungs and also the bronchi and the lungs themselves. And these, the mucus also traps the pathogens from the entrance into the respiratory and the GI uh, organs themselves. So other chemical barriers now, we just finished mechanical, we're talk, gonna talk about chemical barriers. Now, mostly these chemical barriers are enzymes. So they're enzymes that are certainly involved in or engaged in other processes, but they can also be utilized to digest microorganisms as well as you know the steak we had for dinner. Um, but we also have enzymes that are in the tears, for instance, and those uh, are do a terrific job of digesting gram-positive cell walls, and we'll learn about the cell wall and bacteria, uh, and also that the saliva, our saliva contains a enzyme called amylase, and the purpose of amylase is to digest carbohydrates, but what's to say that the enzyme can't also digest the carbohydrates that are on the cell walls of these bacteria, for instance? So the pH provides a terrific barrier because if you can imagine pathogens who get into the body through food have to pass the very acidic environment that's found in the stomach. So if we have pathogens that uh, infect the digestive tract. We, we've heard a lot about the norovirus. Uh, that actual virus has to survive the acid bath that occurs in the stomach. But not just the digestive tract has uh, acidic pH. We also have sweat. We have gastrin, which is actually found in the stomach. And then our urine, of course, is acidic as well. And we all know the wife's tale or the mother's tale about drinking cranberry juice when you think when one thinks they have a uh, urinary tract infection. Well, there is some truth to uh, taking cranberry because or drinking cranberry juice because it causes the urine to become more acidic. And uh, uh, microorganisms do not like acidic environments, although some seem to be very successful at e evading uh, the acidity of these environments. So the lungs, besides having mucus, also have surfactants, which are liquids that in particular bind lipopolysaccharides. What are lipopolysaccharides? Well, remember we talked in the chemical lecture. Saccharides, whenever you see that word, you know that word pertains to carbohydrates and lipo always pertains to lipids. So these are carbohydrate lipid molecules that are found on microbial cell surfaces. And these actual surfactants also signal opsonization by the phagocytes. Now the phagocytes we're gonna learn are a particular kind of immune cell. So this uh, surfactants can actually identify these microorganisms that can then be eradicated by the phagocytes. And then we have a particular enzyme chemical called defensin, which are terrific at eradicating gram-negative uh, bacteria. 
So here is a diagram, a picture of the different physiological mechanisms. Now, most microbiology exams will ask you some questions about the physiological barriers. So it's important to have a good understanding that they involve the mucosa. They involve actually some organs like the tonsils, for instance. We also have enzymes in the eye and in the tear. Uh, we have the uh, various uh, esophageal and peristalsis actions of the uh, reproductive, or not the reproductive, but the respiratory tract and also the act of swallowing and so forth. That peristalsis can move things down, for instance, into the stomach. And also we have bile. So bile is used, is utilized for digestion again, but there is no reason why it can't also digest microorganisms. And we have acidic gastric secretions in the stomach. We have other uh, friendly bacteria that live in the intestinal tract and they certainly could uh, potentially have their own, launch their own attack against these invading bacteria. We also have phagocytes actually in the bladder wall. We have pH of the urine and we also have vaginal bacteria as well as lactic acid. So we have quite a few weapons, so to speak, the first line. So these barriers are also known as the first line of defense. Okay, so that's important to know because we're going to see other mechanisms that are considered second line of defense. So additional topics that we're also going to cover besides describing the immune system are pathogen-specific immune response, hypersensitivity, we're going to talk about tolerance and autoimmunity, immunodeficiency, tumor immunology, and vaccinations. And those will be covered in separate lectures. So our final uh, exam, or not exam, but our final example is what mechanisms, and this is really a question that cuts across the entire course. So what mechanisms do pathogens have to overcome the initial first line of defense and overcoming mechanical and chemical barriers. So we can, we can think about various mechanisms that both the bacteria that arthropods possess as well as viruses. So one thing is mechanisms to invade, okay, the skin, okay, including different ways of breaking the skin. Okay, I talked about a few of those. And things like biting or inserting or even having, uh, utilizing breaks in the skin that are already there or were just made. So we know, for instance, one of the things to be concerned about if you get an open wound is infection by microorganisms. So they, they love the open door, right? They can just jump in and, and certainly invade the body that way. So another thing to think about is how to invade the chemical barriers. Okay, and we saw the chemical barriers were pretty formidable. Okay, how to, how to withstand pH? Well, you might wanna have a good cell wall, right? You need something to withstand that acidic environment. What about the tears? It's the same thing. You need to have a good, the pathogen needs to have a good, strong barrier of its own to protect against these extreme environments. So we have other things. We have the viruses also do things like they employ the envelope, and we'll learn about this in, in uh, the virus lecture. They utilize the cell membrane itself of the human host, and then the human host thinks it's just part, it's just another cell. So there are various mechanisms to think about in terms of invading these defenses. And we'll see throughout the entire course that these, that some of the morphology and the different variations and the different mechanisms that these pathogens employ are based on the particular 
uh, avenue of where in the body does the pathogen invade and then also where in the body does the pathogen live and we're going to learn that some pathogens invade the body in one place and then they live somewhere else so this concludes our discussion our introductory discussion of immunology thank you very much for visiting educator.com